Thank you so much. And uh, let me welcome uh, this whole group and panel A. Uh, thank you for joining Ruth's table, the viewing room presenting Building Bridges and Breaking Barriers. We are excited that the technology and the very able staff could mount the exhibition on a virtual platform and facilitate this panel discussion that helps in breaking barriers presented by year long COVID lockdowns. As a curator, I see myself as an interpreter, organizer, promoter of special exhibitions about issues of present time. This round is about ageism and aging. As you may be aware, ageism is stereotyping and a discrimination against individuals or groups on the basis of their age, which, yes, may, be, which may be casual or systematic. The term was coined in 1969 by Robert Neal Butler to describe discrimination, discrimination against se seniors and pattern on sexism and racism. The existing biases of ageism in our society are profound and represent deeply entrenched cultural problem. New research reveals that about 82% of Americans who are 50 and older say they have experienced prejudice, discrimination and stereotyping based on their age. This exhibition calls attention to creativity as a way to build bridges and break barriers, promote the visibility of older adults and recognize their continued value and contribution to the arts and society. Our programming at Ruth Table is aligned with the mission of COVIA that calls for positive aging by cultivating healthy and engaged communities with the continuum of innovative services and actively support intellectual engagement. Uh, so now I would like each of you, what I mean is Corey, Corey Weiner, John Schultz, and Liz Mamorski to introduce yourself and tell us if this is the first time you are in an exhibiting artist with Roots Table. Come in. And what? I have it. Have it. Be, be, please be concise in your uh, answers because we have a lot to cover. Corey? Uh oh, I was afraid of that. Um, I wanted to thank, first of all, Marguerite and Hannah for all their work to make the exhibition and to put this together. Uh, and I also wanted to say a special hello to my residents and co-workers who may be watching me out there, uh, who support me and inspire me both in my work at the plaza and in my painting. I work at Rhoda Goldman Plaza as the food and beverage director, which is a faith-based assisted living community in San Francisco. I'm proud, very proud to work with a great management team uh, that includes healthcare activities, dining services, uh, resident services, housekeeping, facilities management, and a lot of other things. We have residents from many walks of life, many professions, including some talented artists. Our residents remain engaged in current events, the arts and learning and range in age from the early, their early 60s to 100 plus years of age. I had, I had stopped painting for some 25 years uh, to find my financial way, you know, like food, rent, things like that, important. Um, I've been here for 20 years and about midway, I felt safe and secure enough to resume painting. As always, I do self, self portrait, I do portraits and I, as always, I started with a self portrait and have been painting portraits again. We will ask you questions pertaining to your work specifically. Oh, Just okay. a short introduction, so I think. Oh. We learned okay. a lot about you already, and it seems okay. you are a very busy person. Good, so, done enough. Uh, so uh, now I will, uh, now will be my question direct, directed to you. Okay, let me just have Liz quickly introduce herself. Hi, I'm Liz Mamorski, and uh, 
I've been a Californian since 1970. Having come from New York, where I lived, I lived the first part of my life at first, but now much longer out here. And uh, I've been through many different things, which you'll hear about in the course of this. And I just want to say thank you so much, Hannah, for, for, for making this happen, for curating me into the show. And Rita, thank you for providing access. I am I'm thrilled and delighted to be showing at Ruth's Gallery for the first time, Ruth's Table. Thank you. Uh, next, please, Joan. Hi, I married in California in 1959. Um, originally from Chicago, S declared myself a full-time artist in 1970 and um, upended my family in that we were all in it together to help mom have her career. And I have a studio in San Francisco since 1995, full-time working artist on my own, travel 19 countries, lecturing, mm -hmm. teaching, and um, I'm really big in China, <laughs> just, where they love older people. I go there and I'm the queen. I come back here and I'm that old lady over there. <laughs> so okay. anyway, I find cultural differences in how we're perceived. Okay, thank you. So my uh, question now is directly to Corey. And I want to, I want to talk to you about the portraits and I'm sure that people who went to our website have seen have seen the work of all of you so they are familiar with it and I'm sure that we will have some pictures shown here. So uh, the general purpose of the portrait is to create some kind of monument to the sitter. It transmits some kind of sympathy or understanding a side effect is the communication of qualities, sometimes less endearing. And that's not my quote, it's a quote of somebody else. But the images the here you portray women of older, older adults. So the question here is, when a viewer looks at these portraits, do you think they, they have the power to affect perception about older adults and, age, and aging in general. What would you like the viewer to see in these images? Mm -hmm. well, I think what I'd like the viewer to see is whatever they actually see and react to. I mean, I paint my experience of the sitter but that's only my experience. And I expect the people who view the paintings to have their own experience. And as you said, sometimes it's a negative experience. And I feel that comes from people who are, you know, thinking about perhaps unconsciously themselves and seeing what's and seeing that in the portrait. Um, I don't believe that I dictate in any way people's experience of the painting and their thought process about it, I think that people create that for themselves. Thank you. I have another question. Uh, what's your approach to portraiture? Uh, I just, you know, no matter what plan I make, I always, what I, once I put the paint to the canvas or the panel, whatever I'm working on, I just do what I see um, and follow what and follow what I see on the on the panel. So I I don't have a set process. I just sort of go at it. If that's okay. yeah. Okay. Uh, another question directed to you too, and it's what about self portrait? What do you discover about yourself? And is it how you want to be seen? How do us, others see you? Well, I, I do port, self portraits all the time. And it's, you know, as I age, I'm seeing how I see myself and portray myself uh, change. I've, you know, noticed a lot of changes in my face, which doesn't necessarily make me happy, uh, but, I think it's important to just look and paint what I see and then let people, including myself, kind of think about what that means 
not only about the person portrayed, but about the person viewing. So it's, it's, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's my answer. Uh, remember, there are no wrong questions and you answered the question. Okay. And, uh, we invite other people to, to either argue with you, disagree, agree, and we welcome the abundance of uh, answers. And as, it, as we said, we can, you can uh, put, uh, put your comments later on because we uh, are on, our, uh, on the website of uh, Root Table. And the last question that I direct to you, uh, Corey, is what do you observe about creativity and maturity with all that experience under your belt? Can, and then a follow-up question to that is, uh, can creativity be nurtured? Uh, well, certainly it can be nurtured. Um, you know, we often let other people nurture our, our creativity, our teachers and our peers. But I find that in the studio, just having things the way I want them to be, to be quiet and to be alone um, is very nurturing to me. I can do whatever I want and I don't have to, I don't have to worry about, I'll, I'll, it's only my own judgments I have to worry about, nobody else's. <laughs> um, so yeah, I do think creativity is nurtured by a lot of factors. Okay. So before I uh, leave the topic of uh, portraiture, I want, I am reminded and I want to remind you of a famous uh, a quote that is associated with uh, Alice Toklas, who uh, is talking about Picasso. And as you, rem as you probably well know, Picasso did the portrait of Gertrude Stein. And at that time, it seems like Alice Toklas was not really happy with that portrait. And, uh, and Picasso being probably very fast on his feet, he said, everybody says that she doesn't look like, like it, but that does not make any difference. She will. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. And I think like whatever you, how you answered it, I think, over those years, I am beginning to understand his statement. Well, yeah, I, you, many people don't like their portraits. There's the famous portrait of the Queen of England by Lucian Freud, which is another one. I always think it's probably hanging in the royal bathroom. But uh, <laughs> I, think, I think I lost my train of thought. Um, <laughs> I think that the portrait is not about the person sitting, but about the perception of the person painting and then the perception of the people who view it. And I don't think that a portrait has to look like the person as much as it has to feel like the person yeah. or, or feel like their emotional state. Yeah, so it's very similar. What you are saying is an artist, his name is uh, Umberto Boccioni, and he was uh, very famous during the Futurist movement. And that's what basically it's the same sentiment that you are mentioning. So thank you very much for that portion. Don't leave because we will get back to you. So now let me move very quickly to Liz Memorsky. <clears throat> Before we start, I want, you, I want to take you back to your college years in Bennington. We, many of us are familiar with this private, small liberal arts college tucked away in uh, so Southern Vermont. Bennington College maintained its ac academic philosophy that um, is encouraging uh, particularly high level of independence, creativity and critical thinking among its student body. So what impact did Bennington College have on your lifelong career? Boy, <laughs> you, you put that really, you really described the school well. Um, Paul Feely was the, the painter in residence at that time. And uh, he um, was very much of the, the Clement Greenberg School of Art. And uh, 
the thing is we never saw Paul's work really, but he, and he didn't teach us how to paint or do anything, but we learned how to look, how to really yeah. look at art and critique it and, and just things like that. Um, so that was very good. And we, but I, I also came from a very creative family. My parents are both artists, my mother in, uh, as a writer and my father as a composer. And uh, an interesting story to the ties into Bennington. My father was the, the uh, composer in residence in the summers early on when uh, Martha Graham would come out and dance and the Humphrey Weidman group, and he was the pianist for them then. And my mother says that she was carrying me at the time and she'd walk down on Commons Green and look out and said, if I ever have a daughter, she will go here and voila. <laughs> Although I never got pushed that way, but it was a, it was a good story. <laughs> Yeah, it is. I, I never knew that one. Yeah. Okay, so uh, the next question to you is, let's talk about your two works in the viewing room. And let's start with the op art. This work is part of your earliest series of works that begins more or less after your graduation. So what is, so what is op art and how did your op art series and this piece come to be? Oh boy. Well, this was sort of the second iteration of my opera. This was from 1971. The earlier works were even more color field painting, you know, two, maybe three colors at the most. And then I got into this very cellular, cellular thing that, that happened. And like with everything I do, everything's intuitive. I just start making marks on the canvas and then things morph and crawl and creep and, and then, other things take their place, and um, but the, but this series, uh, I really like this one. It's nice to see it up there. Yeah. So okay. you're you're wanting to know how I got into this series? It was really just something that that I did, and the the other the other people who were working. Um, now this was, I'd already moved to California. I moved out here in '70, so I did this out here. The interesting thing is. These colors reflect a California sort of color scape because in New York, all my paintings were like hot reds, greens, purples, like much like the photography I do now, but uh, they were all that. And it was because I loved being out at night in New York. That was my favorite time. You, you couldn't see the, the dirt or anything, but these colors, the neon colors, and I didn't realize the change when I got to California, I was living high in the hills of Woodacre, overlooking a valley, and there were double rainbows. I had never seen a double rainbow, and it was just incredible. And then I saw in retrospect that my colors were those colors. They were sun, they were green, uh, they were growing uh, poppies and all kinds of things like that. So uh, place really has a place in my art. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, normally when we look at the uh, uh, op art, we associate it with more or less, uh, uh, first it started with black and white, like uh, Bridget Riley and Victor Vasarelli. But then there is also color that comes later. But what I see that yours is so distinct and the fact that you came to California, it seems like it became more rounded and more friendlier. So at any rate, if you want to comment about uh, the, uh, the all part of the 60s that was uh, geometric forms. And then the question is like, how, how did people react to your type of op art? Ah, people liked it very much. Um, well, as I wrote, uh, after graduation, I came back to New York and then started to get to know the different galleries. And it was much easier then. You know, you just, you have your, some of it weren't even slides. They were just um, color prints of what I had done. I mean, photographs. And you could take them around and people would actually look at them. It was wonderful. And uh, so there was a gallery that was very interested in my work called The Contemporaries at 79th and Madison. And it was wonderful with windows right on the corner, windows front and side. And uh, 
they they represented um, uh, oh gosh what was his name wonderful wonderful op artist um, but he did the more geometric ones I'm just drawing a blank right now and he was very geometric and they liked my work because it was um, it was very organic and biomorphic but it was still that and the whole thing about getting things to pop is interesting you get it's called retinal flash. And if your colors are the same tonality and they're at opposite ends of the color spectrum, then you can get this popping happening. And you get it by sort of squinting your eyes. And if everything grays out to the same color, you know that you've got it. So I was working in acrylic. So you put on one layer here and then another one, the other color against it and readjust. And then you could expand that over the whole canvas. Mm -hmm. So um, also you mentioned black and white. There was a show that my gallery, the Contemporaries, did. It was called the Black and White Show, and the people in it were absolutely amazing. Marcarelli, uh, me, I've I did black and whites, also, and just some wonderful people. I I wish I had had mm -hmm. it at my fingertips, but um, yeah. So that's I have a very a quick follow follow up question to that. Is that Okay, the, you did those in the 70s, that, that's a long time ago. And now uh, we had this conversation that here and there, uh, op art pops up again. And my question to you is, uh, can you get back in this style again? Oh, I never go back to anything. Okay. Every, every time. So then I went to the, this very surrealist, visionary kind of art. And then I just, started collecting a lot of uh, reclaimed electronics like circuit boards and uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. I'd go to junk shops and, and I started making sculpture and I just, and I wanted it to light up. So I taught myself how to light. I taught myself joinery. I mean, because I had no skills like that. But the nice thing about not knowing how to do something is you can come up with some really creative solutions to it. And so, um, I spent about 20 years really concentrating on the sculpture. And um, maybe every four years I go back, do a little painting, but I, my heart was in the sculpture then. And then, I don't know, do you want me to get into what I'm doing now? Or <laughs> I can't, you're muted, Hana. You have to unmute yourself. No, still muted. Can you hear me? Yes, now I can hear you. Okay, so uh, now let me just say, ask you the question that uh, we know that after so many years, uh, you have uh, recently picked up a digital camera. So I want to ask you questions uh, regarding your photography. And uh, this recent body of work is so different that what you have done preview, previously. And I don't know if it is Corona related or not, but if there is a difference between you sitting in the studio most of the time and now you are just out there roaming in the streets and uh, really flying like a bird. So uh, tell, us about, um, tell us about this transition to photography. And am I correct to say that it was triggered by the fact of uh, the uh, corona lo lockdown. And what barriers did you have to overcome in order to master um, the photography? Okay, no, it had nothing to do with corona because I really started taking pictures with my trusty Apple, um, my Mac, no iPhone. And uh, start, I started really around uh, 2016. But in 18, I really had a clearer picture of what I was doing. And, um, you know, having having the lockdown has really been kind of a blessing because I, you know, just put on my mask and I go outside, I walk around, I've discovered areas of the city. I never, I, I knew the names of but I'd never been in. So all over and these wonderful houses and people and, but I mainly do buildings um, and I, I love old cars. Uh, so it, I'm very excited about this. I love, 
I love, I, I'm an urban explorer and I love capturing these images. And then I love going back into the studio and editing them. It, it's just thrilling. And then I, I look at the blank canvas that I've had on an easel in the downstairs part of my studio because my office is upstairs. The, uh, and I look and I go, mm, I should do something with that. Oh, later, you know, and I look at the, I have some more little art bots going on and I just kind of left them. Uh, but things to me in the past that I thought I would never be able to stop, like the painting and the sculpture, I stopped, but not forever because who knows what will turn up next. There's always something new. And you asked about barriers. I mean, I, I used to figure with, with cameras you know, I couldn't really, yeah, I had a brownie, a little brownie camera when I was a kid. I liked that. It was, that was my level. And then, you, you know, people were saying, oh, but you need to learn real cameras and F-stops. And I go, ah, I can't do that. And I guess it just wasn't time because I always feel that when, it, when it's right for something to happen for me, I'm receptive and it happens. And then I learned about iPhoneography and I, I just, I love it. It's just my little thing. It carries, I goes with me everywhere. And um, I'm in love with all these buildings and with meeting people through, through mainly Instagram, but there's also um, our photofolio, which is one of the groups I'm in and uh, Facebook. So, but uh, meeting, having touch with people all over the world and seeing what they're doing, it just, everything's opened up. So, um, Life goes on. <laughs> I have yeah. life in the studio in, in spite of COVID. It's, it's great. So let me just tell you that uh, this exhibition is uh, about uh, breaking barriers and building bridges. And when I looked at, uh, at uh, the two uh, works that you submitted, I saw like you have been building a bridge between the op art and photography and the common denominator out of the colors here. That, so uh, go ahead. Yeah, I said that was really well put, Anna. That's what I wanted to say. You really did tie that together. Um, and I hadn't really realized that, but yes, I, I love colors. I just love it. And sometimes people will say to me, um, maybe you shouldn't use so much saturation and I say, but the house was saturated. I find very saturated houses and sure, I may own some of them up. Some you are attracted up. to them. Yeah. And but but being, does, yeah, when we drive, we don't really notice them. So that's a good thing. It's so right. when you're on foot, you really notice so much more than when right, you're on Right, so the same question I asked Corey and it's what do you observe about creativity and maturity? With all the experience under your belt, I'm sure that you can say, uh, you have something to say about creativity. And also, how is creativity nurtured? Uh, well, when my, my two sons were young, I, I would go into their schools and volunteer um, because they'd removed the art program, so I would, teach art, basically, you know, pro bono. And I would tell the kids, you know, don't draw a house, don't draw a tree or a sun, just start making marks on the paper and see what happens because that's basically how I work. You just just plunge in, get your hands wet. And some some wonderful, and now when I have grandchildren, I've done that with their, with their schools too, with their, with their wonderful art teachers. And we've done some, some great projects. So I think uh, it can definitely be nurtured by, by really giving free reign to the kids, giving them inspiration, showing them pictures of things, but encouraging them to just use their imaginations and not try to do this or try to do that, but just do what they want. I wish you were my, uh, my teacher when I was in uh, fourth grade. <laughs> Uh, okay, so now uh, thank you very much. And I now move to Joan Schultz. Uh, Joan is, a, uh, is into quilt making and uh, sometimes known as art, art quil uh, quilting, mixed media art quilts or fiber art quilts. 
It's an art form that uses both modern and traditional quilting technique to create art objects. That uh, very much defines you, right, Joan? It's close, yeah. Okay, you can correct me. Practitioners of quilt art create it based on their experiences, imagery, and ideas, rather than traditional patterns. So do you have a long and and you have a long and uh, notable career in quilt making. Tell us about your practice. What is surprising you about your quilting and, and um, quilts? Well, I uh, am an autodidact. I, I've taught myself most of the things that I do in my artwork. And um, when I said I was going to do this for the rest of my life in 1970, I started teaching right away because I'm a trained teacher. I taught elementary school for six years. So I was a, a good person for someone to meet who wanted to know techniques and so forth. And also how not to worry about rules. I said, there are no rules. We'll just make whatever you can think of. And so for four years, I taught embroidery and design and I would just be learning it myself, but turning it into teaching techniques because I'm a teacher. I've always been a teacher from the fifth grade till now, I haven't stopped teaching. So um, 1974 came and people were saying, well, what quilt are you gonna do for the bicentennial? And I said, and why would I do a quilt? I didn't even look at quilts. I didn't think about them, never had them in my life. If there was a quilt show, I didn't go. I mean, I was really a snob. I just felt it had nothing for me. But then someone said, well, Joan, College of San Mateo and the uh, uh, Cupertino adult ed is looking for a quilt teacher and they pay $25 an hour. This is in 1974. So I said, oh, so I went to interview and they said they liked my resume and, um, I, could I start? And I said, well, in six months, because I figured I needed six months in order to teach myself how to make a quilt. <laughs> and I started, 60 people showed up to the first night at Cupertino. And I looked at the sea of people and I said, I, I, there's too many people. So I went to the office and we broke it down to three classes. And that was the beginning of my love of quilts. I saw what it did for my students, what it did for me. I was always a week behind or a week ahead of them um, in what I was going to present. And they did fantastic work. And then College of San Mateo took me on, even though I didn't have a master's and uh, or a BFA or anything like that. But I had a portfolio and I had exhibitions already. And I was um, into some of the local groups like Bay Area Arts and Crafts Guild and the Peninsula Stitchery Guild. And I became president of both of those uh, groups over time. They were very meaningful because all these people in those groups were masters of fine arts or at least a BFA and I was the outlier. So I kept very quiet. I just learned and listened and uh, my work grew, got accepted into uh, exhibitions and that was the beginning of my career and the quilts became more and more important because I could work really large. I could hand quilt and still be a mom of four because they knew where I was. I was in the room, you know, and stitching away and really working. So quilts allowed me to be a fuller, a more fuller artist than I would have been if I had stayed in embroidery and all of those related yeah. uh, techniques. So let me interject now, and I would like you to talk about the two quilts that you have in, in this show and yes. explain the differences and also talk about the digital uh, revolution and how it affects your work. Right. This quilt was done during the uh, deluge in California after a six year drought. And our roof was leaking and people were flooding away and order, 
for me to um, stay sane, I created this. It's 72 inches by 72 inches, and it's all hand quilted. Machine piece, but hand quilted. And one of a kind, I dyed my own fabric. If, if it looks dyed, I did that. Um, there's a silk, and people were saying, well, you, you can't make these quilts in silk, and you can't do this, and you can't do that. And I said, well, it's not even arguable. I'm already doing it, so just look and see, and forget about saying I can't do it, <laughs> just because I'm already doing it. So this one is called cloud riding, and I put myself mentally up in the clouds, not worrying about the rain, and the diagonal marks, I did them for, because I liked them, but 30 years later, I realized that's how I see. Because when you see the new work, which is based on the construction across on Mariposa um, in San Francisco, where they created this rather huge development, but I documented that from the time it was a bus station to the time now where it's quite a fancy upmarket, absolutely gorgeous building. And to think I went to City Hall and said they shouldn't build it. <laughs> so what do artists know? Um, what about the second one? So the second one has, much to my surprise, images that are dependent on the diagonal. And, and these are digital prints of my photographs. And what they are are reflections in my window, which is a really large window. And I would get like the Father Morgana um, uh, experience in that images are cast up into the sky and you see them. And it's really a phenomenon that's true. I've seen one for real and I've read a lot about it. So this new series, depending on the diagonal lines in the windows and the sky, and then the construction across the street. They're pretty fabulous quilts. I, I did them, it was like a gift. I, after being so annoyed that they took away things that I like to look at, like a complete view of the city from the south, and now it's very closed in, but I'm looking through this very European garden and I, would welcome you in my neighborhood to go stroll through it. It's quite an addition. Okay. Very clever, very beautiful, very powerful garden that I get to look at whenever I'm up in the studio. And I haven't been able to go because of COVID. But I just, when I finish my shots, I'm going to be back in the studio. So. I want to invite everybody to look at your website because it just is very different what you are showing here and the variety and diversity and productivity are really overwhelming and very impressive. So well, I, have a new, uh, wiki, I have a brand new wiki page, um, okay. which my granddaughter of age 19, who didn't know my work that much, but she had four months before she went back to school because of COVID, she's uh, University of San Francisco, and so I hired her as an assistant and I said, your job is to create a wiki page for me. And she did all the research. She became very uh, knowledgeable on how you put this page together. She read everything that's ever been written about me. She had the best time, she said. She'd find something, she'd race down the stairs. Mom, mom, did you know that grandma did this? So what she did was become my archivist. Oh, great. She knows more than I know about my career because she has a memory. That's good. I don't have that kind of memory anymore. And she had this great appreciation for my career. And I, I keep looking forward. I don't look backwards. But she helped me appreciate what I have done. Anyway, the wiki page is fabulous. I mean, it's, I couldn't have... Yeah ask for better. It's amazing. And my website is uh, newly recreated. We lost everything up in a cloud. Um, uh, I lost a hard drive. I lost my website. I lost so many things. And little by little, I'm figuring out what I need to get back. 
in a reading day. But anyway, I'm having the time of my life. And I, and I say that knowing that my husband died three years ago. Jim died of Alzheimer's. And when our last conversation that was understandable, he looked at me and he said, I'm really worried that you're not going to do your artwork. And I want to, you to do your artwork. And I didn't know it was our last conversation. When you're married 59 years, you have these witty things. And I said to him, I said, oh, Jim, you know I take care of myself. I realized what a smart aleck I was. But he, he understood and he knew that I was going to continue to work. Okay. And I was his full-time caretaker because he had lost all everything. And I managed to create work during this horrible time, not knowing that I was working. I felt like when I looked at what I had done in the year before he died and the year after, I went, who is this person? And I and I'm going to I'm going to ask, I'm I'm giving these books away as gifts around the world. And I want you each to have because it documents the work I did, all the poems I wrote, a history of Jim, the meaningful things he did for me when he was alive that continue to do for me when he's not here. Okay. And I can honestly tell him that I am working flat out, creating monumental work, writing like I haven't written in a very long time, And I have a boyfriend. Okay, let me just uh, move. There is another question for you. Yes. And this is uh, for years, quilting, textile art, and weaving were considered as craft. Mm -hmm. Is the debate still on? Who is winning this debate? And are there other stigmas attached to quilt making? Is that a question that is appropriate for you? No. I don't even answer it. It, it. it has no bearing at all on the work. And as I tell people, I said, forget about this uh, argument. I mean, you look at the work, the work is the work, and it either stands at art in that person's eyes or not. And I don't have to worry about that. And I think we shouldn't even worry about that because it takes time away from really important thoughts that we have that we're putting into our work. And it's not a debate worthy of our time. Okay, wonderful answer. And I think we are happy to, to hear that because some of the old uh, arguments and debates never retire. And I think you put an end to that, okay? Yeah. So uh, the question that uh, I ask uh, the previous two artists, I want to ask you, and this is about creativity, maturity, and how do you uh, what do you have to say about nurturing creativity? Well, we're, uh, I'm going to be 85 this year, and we're in that zone where we can do anything we want, and we should. There's no reason why we can't keep writing or sculpting or whatever the art form is, or even change art forms and pick up something new. Working for yourself is, is a thrill. And if you reach that time of life where you're working for yourself and you don't have to worry about making too much money, just keep working. That is our gift to ourselves and also a gift to our children because we're showing them that you always can be productive. You always are in charge of your life. You decide whether to work or not. And I'm so grateful that I still have the energy to, to do the work. I'm mad as hell about losing a year like everybody else in the traveling part. But you turn that around and you travel inside your mind. And you concentrate on what's in front of you. Because if you start thinking about all of the crazy ass stuff that's happening in the world, 
how we lived through some really extraordinary times. And we're still standing and we're still working. And that's our gift to anybody who needs a, a hand up to, to do some artwork or writing or even just getting up and walking around. So, so our, our life is about inspiring others right now. I think we can inspire ourselves absolutely, but because we've reached that age where people expect you to be not productive and we show them what we do, it knocks them for a loop and it changes people's minds. This is a perfect answer because this is really the purpose of this exhibition to change minds and yes. change perception of older adults. So uh, uh, really this is uh, something that, this is a great nugget to have on our Zoom recording. I so one, one thing I wanna add, I, I had to talk on the phone to somebody at Kaiser Permanente and at the end of the conversation, she said, you don't sound 84. And I said, <laughs> <laughs> and I, I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you just don't sound 84. And so here it is, even through the telephone, there's a pre idea of who this person is going to be who picks up the phone and answers questions. So anyway. Mm -hmm. We have a big job to do. Yeah, great. So remember at the beginning of my introduction, I said uh, that uh, there, is, uh, there are some elephants in the room. And now, uh, and because we are virtual, we can have more than one elephant. So that second elephant is uh, COVID, the COVID effect. So uh, as you know, and the reason why I'm bringing it up because it disproportionately affected older adults. And we have uh, heard from the over, it's almost a year since the pandemic, and we know how hard it hit uh, nursing homes and so forth. Negative attitudes about there from young people and so forth. And I don't want to repeat what we have heard. So I want to say that um, uh, at a root table, when pandemic hit, uh, we launched a creative initiative to help keep the elder communities engaged and connected through art. And we have reached over 1,500 older adults and just opened an exhibition of their work called Enduring Inspiration in COVID era. So how did it affect you professionally and where do you find inspiration? So. Can you just um, have, uh, and I am directing that question to Corey, to Liz and Joan, to talk about uh, uh, maybe COVID did not affect you, your art, maybe did, maybe because you were sheltered, you were more productive and you paid attention to other things. So please comment on uh, the COVID effect. Well, I'll, I'll jump in here. Um, because of my age, my grandchildren isolated for two weeks at, to come visit me and, and had a, a COVID test. We kept the social distancing. But the reason they did that, they said, is that they didn't want to kill grandma. So I became very lonely. I mean, they, they did that and I said, please don't do that anymore because you, you have a life and I don't want you thinking so much. I said, I'll, I'll be fine. But I did get very lonely until I figured out that it was my job to get the phone and start calling my friends around the country just to shock them because I don't talk on the phone very much. I'll, I'll do the computer, I'll do texting, but I'm not a phone person. And that brought me out of this feeling of loneliness because I'm in this house that used to have four children and a husband and there's nobody but me. 
Okay, next list, please. Oh, <laughs> um, I, I think I sort of touched on this before. Um, I, you know, I, I don't really have much of an answer about that. I talked about going out and exploring the city and finding wonderful things to photograph. Um, you know, I, I've always been kind of a hermit. Oh, I think yeah. it's a very healthy attitude to have. Just go on with life and uh, not to have it affect you. And I'm glad that you are well and uh, doing all those things. Uh, then, uh, Corey, please, can you uh, uh, respond to this COVID effect? Well, you know, I've seen the COVID effect not only on myself and my family, but especially with my residents. I've been, you know, working straight through as a somewhat essential worker. People need to, my residents need to eat during COVID, and I see how hard it is for them. Um, and it, it also kept me engaged somewhat because I was able to be with my coworkers and not so much with my residents anymore. But I also found out that with, I'm quite content to be my, by myself, which I didn't know before. So that's, that's kind of the effect it's had on me is just learning about what emotions, it's really slowed down my reaction to people and allowed me to really watch and feel what others are going through that I wouldn't have noticed before. And it was a shock to me to find out that I liked being alone. I didn't know that. Okay, well, thank you for that. And now I'm coming to the last portion of our program. And the question that uh, ties us to the uh, theme of the exhibition, to the title of the exhibition. And uh, I will uh, want us to comment about building bridges. So we all know that undemi undeniable power of art is to challenge and shape ideas and build bridges in ways that can bring communities together. As an artist, how do you see yourself uh, or art in general as the builder of bridges and what barriers still await demolition for you personally in work or otherwise? Well, I'll jump in. Um, because I've been a teacher all my life, I've been building bridges all my life. And especially go, uh, re representing America by going to, um, I was in the um, USIS program, uh, cultural exchange. And so I would, show up and give workshops and talk about American quilts and so forth. And building bridges there because the people in Italy and the people in Luxembourg and Germany and so forth weren't up on quilts as art. And so that was my building a bridge that they could look at our work, which is now international, and understand it as art and not even asking that question, just knowing that it was hard work. So whenever I go to speak, and I will resume that when, when, we're, when the world has opened up, I'll go back on the road and talk about art um, and the digital world and all of that other that I'm in. I think just by doing our artwork, we're building a bridge. You don't have to say, I'm building a bridge. You just make the artwork. And that's the bridge for someone to look at the art and get the idea that maybe they'd like to do something like Well, we need those bridges because not, yeah. not that, especially with young people, they are not uh, supporting the arts. And, uh, and it's not just the visual arts. It's also, uh, we're, talking, we're talking about museums, symphonies, ballet and so forth. We know that there is a crisis and now with COVID uh, uh, financially they are broke and uh, one third of museums will close. Uh, so and especially here where we are very close to Silicon Valley, we know how much they support us and I'm being cynical. So uh, and now Liz, do you want to add something to that? 
I, I think Joan really uh, hit it on the head with what she was saying that we, through our art, build bridges. People see the work, you can talk about it, you can compare um, what you're doing with what they're doing. And um, it, it was easier pre-COVID times when people could come into my studio and see the work and we could talk. And um, there, there, it is happening online now, but I really miss, I miss that one-on-one -on -one contact with people. Yeah, and Corey, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I love museums, um, but they are for people who can afford them and they don't, haven't really made the effort to bring young people and, you know, challenge, financially challenged people in. And I think they're an old model. I see the digital explosion as changing the way people can access art. And I think young people and old people are building those bridges. The old model is not accessible anymore. And the new models that are emerging are really building bridges between young and old and between people who have money and people who don't. And they're building, you know, these works that we can see online or on the street, you know, graffiti is, is a whole form in and of itself that allows more people to see and experience and even do art. You know, there's a lot of argument about graffiti and, and vandalism, but it still has an important place. So I, I, while I'm saddened about the demise of museums, I'm encouraged by all the new forms of expression and showing art and doing art that are coming out. And I, I love seeing what young people are doing and old people too. Okay. Now, uh, now I want to open uh, uh, this forum to questions from uh, our listeners, if you have any questions. The question is for Corey, how does she choose her subjects? Uh, I, it's just people who interest me more than anything. Um, I love, when people interest me, I want to paint them. It allows me to kind of, in some ways, figure them out for myself. And that's how I choose them. And have you changed your the way you choose people over the years? Are you painting yeah, older people? Or are you painting um, different mm -hmm. kinds of art with people? Well, I've always done portraits. I think I started with old people when I came to the plaza because I saw so many faces and so many. Uh, we have a tremendous photographer here, our assist, uh, administrative assistant, and she takes portrait photos of our residents. And I, I started by stealing them off her desk and painting them, <laughs> painting them secretly. And, and then I started asking for permission to paint them, and it evolved into a, a uh, annual portrait show with a school I was attending, and it became quite a tradition. Hey, that's wonderful. Any other questions? Thank you, Ruth, for your question. You're welcome. I have a comment. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So um, I know two of the artists personally, and uh, I now know something about Corey Weiner. And this is a wonderful show. This is a terrific show because I, I love the people I'm looking at and looking at their work. And um, we're all the same age, and I love this. This is great. Everything they said is what I feel. And I love it. I, I love all I love you. <laughs> I think that's the beautiful thing about this exhibition because yeah. I took chances. We didn't know how it's going to resonate. And I think uh, we all enjoyed it. And uh, I'm happy to uh, embrace every idea. Beautiful. Uh, do we have time for one more question? Okay. Is that okay? Hello. <laughs> Go ahead. Oh, oh. Hello. I'm interested in visiting artists' studios. I kept hearing about them when I first came a couple of years ago, but I don't seem to have a chance, so I don't know to whom to ask. Do we have any trip or visiting, um, you know, visiting artists? the studio. 
I would love to visit artist studio. <laughs> you feel such a trip? Thank you for your question, Hannah. Do you want to take this? <laughs> Yeah, well, we just have to wait a little bit more for COVID to disappear, and then we can visit the studios. And uh, I, there are really wonderful studios. And going to Liz's place, it's like uh, we'll open a, a whole new, a, a whole new perspective of what an artist studio looks like and how it should be. So uh, it's really an amazing. Uh, it, it, it's an amazing uh, place to visit. She calls it Lizland, and I think it's Lizland. It's like being in Disneyland. So I, uh, I, uh, I'm sure that she will be open to that when time permits. And we can schedule some others. Just uh, let us know, or we can put it on website when we are ready to do those trips. Uh, so yeah, if there are no other questions, I want to thank you for spending the afternoon with, uh, with us and giving us the privilege to delve deeper into the show and getting to know the artist. Now, this exhibition is in two parts. So we have another, this, the, this exhibition has two, two major groups and we will have four panels. So we are done with this panel next week, March 11, the same place, the same time is another panel discussion and you will see different questions, different art, and it will be just as enlightening and just as uh, uh, educational what you have experienced today. So I hope you will join us then and I cannot leave this forum without being uh, thankful to the supportive team behind the scenes who helped building the viewing room and making our Zoom panel possible. So thank you very much, Rita, and everybody else who is around you. So thank you very much for being here, and I hope to see you next time.